Thanks.
Tell me of the home far beyond the sky. Tell me of the home far away. Well, they tell me of the home when a storm comes dry. Oh, they tell me of a cloudy day. Oh, the land of cloudless days. Oh, the land of cloudy skies. John, the second chapter, while you're finding John 2, 13, I want to make two announcements. One, next Saturday at Channing is Christmas in July at the XIT, and uh, it, it will be uh, a time when they're trying to raise the roof. They're trying to put a new roof on the XIT general office. Uh, R.W. Hampton is going to be there to sing. Eloy Gonzalez is going to be there to sing. I'm going to be there to pray. <laughs> and uh, so you're invited. There's a, uh, right behind uh, uh, Chad Summers and Lisa back there, there's a, uh, what am I trying to say? A flyer. And it, you can read all about it. I think it starts, what time, Lisa, does it start? Oh, I forgot that she can't, she can't read. <laughs> I know. What time? 
3 p.m. There's going to be chuck wagon meal, uh, and it'll all be donation. It'll all be no, donation. No alcohol. Sorry about that. No alcohol at all. I'm so, so glad they put that on there. Uh, so the other uh, thing has uh, slipped my mind, and I'll tell you, it's, you know, it'll come back. Uh, I find that thoughts are like bullets, and, and they'll come through your mind, and then they'll ricochet around the room. And then they come back. Uh, <laughs> Jamie's, Jamie's not going to be here next Sunday. <laughs> I can hardly wait. But I will tell you this, that is... Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about. Next Sunday, you don't have to listen to me. You get to listen to a Russian Gideon. And uh, he doesn't even speak English. You'll get to, to hear him uh, through an interpreter tell about the work of God's Word in, in Russia and around the world. There will be an offering taken, an uh, open Bible offering at the close. Uh, some of our people probably will help with open Bibles and we'll receive an offering for the Gideons next Sunday. Stand with us, please. Verse 13, chapter 2. The Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple complex, he found people selling oxen, sheep, doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple complex with their sheep and their oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tabernacles. <laughs> I'm sorry, the tables. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Psalm 69 Verse 9, zeal for, for your house will destroy me or consume me. So the Jews replied to him, what sign of authority? The Jews always needed a sign. Have you seen over there by the post office on Amarillo Boulevard and by that new motel, uh, there's, a, there's a billboard and it says, you ask for a sign and it's signed God. The Jews ask for signs. What sign will you give us? He said, destroy, Jesus said, destroy this sanctuary and I will raise it up in three days. The Jews said, this sanctuary took 46 years to build and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the sanctuary of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. While he was in, the, in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many trusted in his name. When they saw the signs he was doing, Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them. This is very important. Don't miss this. Jesus himself would not commit himself to them since he knew their hearts, since he knew them all, and because he did not need anyone to testify about man for he himself knew what is in man. You may be seated. Very quickly, three things I want to say to you God seems to have given this week. First, God's holiness demands holiness in worship. I always worry, and I hope you do, because you see, worship is not just the band. Worship is not just me. Worship is not just uh, us getting together, worship is a participation sport and you are worshiping right now, either in a holy way or an unholy way, either in an acceptable way before God or an unacceptable way and you're the only one who will know that and God, I'm not the one to judge that, the only one I'm responsible for actually is me and yet I am a worship leader as, along with this band a worship leader and we are to lead people in worship to worship in a holy way before a holy God 
Now, you, if you read the Bible very much, you may get con confused here because John is the only by, uh, gospel writer that puts the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke put it at the end. Now there must be a, an explanation for that, so I'll give you at least two possible explanations. One, there may have been two cleansings. One at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, one at the close. It may be that John, in looking back, just decides to include it right here. Now John, when did he write? When did he write his gospel? What? When he was an old man. How old a man? 90. 90 A.D., somewhere along in there, John's writing. Now he's looking back to 30-something A.D. He's looking back over 60 years of serving God. And so he's remembering different things, and he may have just decided, I'm going to tell about the cleansing of the temple right now. Now, they, those people said it, it took 46 years to build the temple. Actually, the Solomon's temple was built and destroyed in 586 B.C. Think about it. Solomon's temple, now, Solomon's temple was built and it was destroyed in 586 B.C. By 516 B.C., they had rebuilt the temple under Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, and others during the Babylonian captivity. From 516 B.C. until now, until the time that Jesus was walking the earth in 30-something A.D., the temple now was being rebuilt by Herod the Great, who reigned from 37 B.C. to 4 A.D., and it was not yet completed. So when they said 46 years, they meant from the time Solomon began to reconstruct the temple and to add on to the temple, it was 46 years. 46 years doesn't even cover a little bit of how long the temple had stood there. Jesus, when he saw, he came in at the Passover and he came into his house. His house! Don't you miss that! Don't you miss that. This is whose house? His house. This is not our house. This is not our place. This is not a place that we own. It's not a place that if this church for some reason closed, that we'd divide up the proceeds. This house belongs to God. This is God's house. And when, when Jesus walked in to God's house at Passover, and he saw, he heard the oxen and the sheep. He smelled the manure. He saw the doves. He saw the money changers. And he got mad. And he made him a whip. And he drove those folks out. Now somebody said, I don't think he used the whip on those people, but on their animals. Well, I don't know. I have no idea about that. I wasn't there. I'm old, but I wasn't there. <laughs> now, what was happening right inside the entrance to the temple, right where the Gentiles could go, these folks had set up their booths, their Starbucks, uh, delicatessens and all. People traveling couldn't bring an animal that far, maybe. So they decided that when they got to the temple, they would buy a sheep. They would buy a lamb. They were charged exorbitant prices. If they had brought a lamb, they, the lamb would be examined, and they said, this lamb is not nearly good enough, and so they would be sold another. The money changers were there. You could only give an offering at the temple with Jewish money, not Roman money, Jewish money. Roman coins had an emperor of the, uh, uh, an image of the Caesar. So the money changers would change your Roman money 
for Jewish shekels, but they would charge you a small fee. Jesus saw that his house had become a marketplace. His house had not become a holy place to worship a holy God, but it was a marketplace. It was a place where people uh, misbehaved and worshipped a holy God in an unholy way. He was mad, and so he turned over their tables, and he drove out their animals, and he said, get out of here and don't come back. Now that goes against kind of what we do, don't we? We say, everybody's welcome. Not if you're going to disrupt worship. Not if you're going to misbehave in worship. Not if you're going to disturb the holy worship of a holy God. Not if you're going to make our worship unholy. The temple needs to be cleansed. Not only that, but Jesus indicated that he had power over death. You see, the cleansing of the temple indicated his deity. The only way Jesus could do what he did was because he was who he was, and that is God. And he said, look, fellas, if you tear down this temple, in three days I'll rebuild it. And they said, it's taken 46 years. Jesus was talking about the temple, was he? The physical temple, what was he talking about? His body. He said simply to them, I've got power over death. Now look at Hosea. It's in the Old Testament. I meant to mark it this morning. I thought, I'll get up there and I won't be able to find it. Hosea's a toughie for me to find. Have you found it? Raise it. No, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you remember I told you last Sunday there's a table of contents in the front of your Bibles? Look at page 901. Somebody asked me this morning, what kind of Bible do you use? Let me tell you one more time. The Christian Standard Version, CSV, Christian Standard Version. Now, I use that not because I... I don't like the King James or the New King James. I like them very much. I'm not so fond of the NIV or the ASV. Uh, I'm not so fond of, uh, of uh, the Living Bible. But I use this because it's simple, because it's, there's no these or thous, and I think all of us uh, can, can uh, understand that. Actually, preaching ought to be done on a third grade level, and I mean that with all my heart. I'm not, I'm not looking down on you guys. There's college-educated folks sitting in this uh, country church, but preaching ought to be done on a third grade level. There should be nobody who walks out of a building like this, out of a, a, a time of worship when they say, I don't know a thing he said. I don't want that to ever happen. Put the cookies on the bottom shelf so the children can get to them. Hosea 6, come, he says, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us and he will heal us. I was thrilled last Sunday. A lady walked out of the church and she said, I want you to know I'm praying for revival at Crossroads Country Church. Wow, that's good stuff. I'll never, I'll never forget that moment when she said, I, I, was, I was elated, I was lifted up. I'm praying for revival at Crossroads Country Church. You've torn us, he'll heal us, he's wounded us, he will bind us up, he'll bind our wounds. He will revive us after two days, and on the third day, He will raise us up so we can live in His presence. Let us strive to know the Lord. His appearance is as sure as the dawn. He will come down to us like the rain, like the spring showers that water the land. I don't think that refers necessarily to Jesus' resurrection. I think it refers to the coming of Christ, and those two days refer to 2,000 years. And that third day refers to the third thousand year. And I believe that perhaps Hosea is giving us a clue that we're closer to the coming of Christ than any of us might imagine. Yes, absolutely good. So Jesus said, I want you all to understand, not only am I in charge of this place, this is my father's house, and we're going to take good care of it, 
but I have power over death. Now, ladies and gentlemen, not only does he have power over death, he's got power over disease, and we know that. The thing that confuses me a little bit sometimes to try to get it across to you is that I know that God can heal. But I also know that when he doesn't heal, that death is defeated at the cross through Jesus Christ. And, and so death is never the victor. Paul said we'll stand at the grave someday and say, Death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? I hope some preacher, when they put me in the sod, will stand and say, Death, you didn't win. All you did was loose this fellow from the things that hobbled him. And he's free now to be with Jesus. Jesus has power over death. Thirdly, and very quickly, I've, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. We're, we're still in good time. <laughs> Jesus did not believe the believers. Now when they, when those people saw what Jesus did and what Jesus said, heard what Jesus said, the Bible says they believed in him, but he didn't what? Commit himself to them. You know why? He didn't believe they were believers. Now folks, I want, I want you to listen very closely to this. There's an intellectual assent. And there are times that people intellectually say I believe I'm a believer but there's and a lot of people this is not original with me a lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches that's the distance from their head to their heart Jesus said you believe there is one God you do well the devils believe and tremble Jesus saw these guys, and they, they were moved by his sign. And they said, we believe. But Jesus wouldn't commit himself to them because he knew their hearts. We look on the outward part of a man, Jesus looks on the heart. You can say a lot of things about believing. But you see... You, I heard, I heard somebody say this week, character is what you are when there's nobody else around. Character is what you are and what you do when you drive in, in, in into some strange town. Nobody ever has seen you. You're absolutely a stranger to everybody in that town. You can do whatever you want to. You can do it with whomever you want to. You can go to whatever place of entertainment you want to. There's nobody that's going to tell on you. There's nobody who's going to know. And what you do is you go to your hotel and you pray and you read the Bible and you go to sleep and you get up early in the morning, you have a good breakfast, and you get out of that town quick because character is what you are when there's nobody else around and nobody knows what you're doing. That's character. It was R.G. Lee, I think, who, who was traveling around, and somebody asked him. They, they were taking him to the hotel, and they said, Mr. Lee, what do you like to do before you go to sleep at night? He said, I like a glass of buttermilk, and I like an onion sandwich. They said, a glass of buttermilk and an onion sandwich. Yes. So he said, if you could get those two things for me, I'll, I'll do well. And the man said, would you mind telling me why? The glass of buttermilk, R.G. Lee says, was so I'll sleep well. The onion sandwich is to assure myself that I will sleep alone. <laughs> Sometimes characters even have to have a little encouragement. Jesus, I think he looks down at a group like this 
and he will say perhaps, there's a believer, there's a believer, there's one, and he'll commit himself to them. I hope when he looks at the preacher, he says, there's a believer. Now, and I'm going to commit myself to him. I think, and my point I'm fixing to make, is that the temple needs to be cleaned up. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. And I happen to know that my temple needs to be clean. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be brought under the control of anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will do away with both of them. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Don't you know that your bodies are part of Christ's body? So should I take a part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For Scripture says the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. Run from sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you? The Bible, the King James says, a temple. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the, of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a child of God, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a place where God resides. Now you can't, you can't, you can't Allow your body to be tied to anything immoral. Now, we're, we're sinful people, and we tend to sin, and we're tempted to sin. I understand that, and I'm not saying anybody's perfect. I'm certainly not saying that I'm perfect. If you ever get that idea, talk to my wife. She's not here. You can call Illinois, and uh, you can talk to her there. Jamie doesn't know nothing. <laughs> Your body is a place where God dwells. You can't habitually, you can't habitually commit immoral acts. You can't. You can't be happy. You can't be content. Let God clean the temple. He knows who the believers are. Sometimes he doesn't believe the believers. But those people that he knows know him. He will commit himself to them. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that, an ama isn't that an amazing thought that God would commit himself to you? We are always talking about committing ourselves to God. God will commit himself to you. What an amazing thing. What an amazing concept of the fact that God the creator of heaven and earth. God, the savior of the whole world. God, the coming king. God, the ruler of eternity. God will commit himself to you. Believers experience that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if there's anything immoral going on in your life, you know it. Because God's talking to you about it. If there's anything immoral going on, clean the temple. I think you'd rather get the broom and clean the temple rather than let Christ not the whip 
and drive out the immoral immoralities. Does that make sense? Clean the temple. How does revival occur when the temples get clean? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, thank you. And certainly, I'm the first that needs to confess my sin to you. Lord, I want my worship to be holy, and I'm worshiping a holy God, and I want it to be acceptable. I want to be an acceptable worshiper of you today. Dear Father God, I uh, accept your forgiveness. And Lord, thank you for convicting me when I do wrong. I don't have any doubt. When I do wrong, I know it. When I'm in a wrong relationship with you, I know it. Nobody has to come to me and say, you're in a wrong relationship with God. Because God, that's what you do. By your Holy Spirit, who resides in this temple. Clean the temple, I pray. Let revival come. I'm, I'm not talking about this house of worship. Although it is your house, I'm talking about each individual heart. You know the hearts of, of men. And you're looking at us, and Lord, we're looking on the outside. You're looking at the inside. We believe that there are believers here. You know who the believers are. And you commit yourself to them. Dear God, I thank you so much for the movement of your Holy Spirit in this place today in Jesus' name. Now your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, the band's going to play right now. Just crank up band. I don't know what God is saying to anybody here. It may be that you need to receive Christ and you need to pray. Maybe you need to come and talk to me. Maybe you need to fill out the form in the bulletin, put it in the feed bucket. I'll call you this week. We'll talk about Jesus. Perhaps you need to come home. You've been drifting away. You've let some things come into your life that uh, don't belong. Maybe you'd just like to, uh, maybe you just need somebody to pray with and you'd like to come and do that. Maybe you'd like to come to the altar. Just sit on the step and pray for a minute and then go back to your seat. You're welcome to do whatever God tells you to do. And I would think that would be a wise thing to do is to do what God tells you to do. Let's stand up and sing. Together I have decided to follow Jesus. I like that song. I thought that's what the band was playing. So we're going to sing uh, a verse uh, or so. Sing out. That sounds good. That's good. Good, good. Sing. I don't care what your next door neighbors, if they're doing that, I don't care. Sing out. To follow Jesus, no turning back. One more, just one more verse. No turning back. We're going to sing just one more stanza. You sing. No, none go away. Good. I still will come. Isn't that good? No, none go away. I'll go all by myself. I don't care. Here's what I'm going to tell you before we sing. Uh, I'll fly away. Let God clean the temple. Let God clean the temple. Join hands. We're going to sing.